You're listening to Cards to the Moon, a podcast about trading cards from both a collector and investor perspective. We hope you'll stick around for the ride as we take a deep dive into the state of the hobby, share some hot takes, hopefully some useful advice and fun stories along the way. Hey guys, welcome back to Cards to the Moon. My name is Clark from 5 Card Guys on Instagram and on 5cardguys.com. And also welcome back to Hyung who returns to the pod after coaching the Team Canada Junior Baseball team in a tournament down in Mexico. We'll ask him about how that went and you know if he did any scouting while he was there for <laughs> us so that you know we know which prospects from around the world might be a good pickup in the hobby. But before we get into it, a quick note that John won't be joining us today as he's recovering from the flu, so hope he feels better soon. And uh, he should be back with us next week. Okay, Hyung, tell us what it was like for the past couple weeks competing against some top-tier baseball talent and any highlights from the tournament. Oh, for sure. I mean, anytime you get to like coach at the national level, I think um, it's it's definitely an amazing opportunity just representing mm-hmm. your country. So, it, like, I appreciate it always. I've been coaching the junior national team now for, I guess it's it's a little over 10 years. And, wow. you know, anytime you, you go, you get to see the, the world's best, kind of like 18 and under talent. So it's an exciting age. But, yeah, we were down in Mexico uh, for the past couple of weeks uh, competing. And then before that, we actually – we went to the Dominican Republic and we had uh, our our camp there. So, right. like like I said, it's it's always an amazing experience. You never know what to expect. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't accomplish our goals there. We ran into mm-hmm. a little, I guess, uh, bad luck. But um, yeah, like I I enjoyed it. The weather was awesome. Coming back here, it kind of sucks. I got the tail end, I guess, <laughs> of the good weather in Toronto. Uh, as as I come back, it it, it got cold yeah. now. So. The weather is definitely, you know, the bonus when, when you're down there, especially being a Canadian. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like uh, I got to see some prospects as well. I guess that right. would be considered a little bit of inside trading. <laughs> but I don't know how <laughs> valuable it becomes because, I mean, there's so many, so many guys out there. You just never know sure. who's going to who's gonna do what. But, you know, while we're down in the Dominican Republic uh, in, our, in our training camp, we get to play kind of like... Um, I guess it would be considered the Dominican Summer League team. So uh, mm. this is when international signees sign when they're 16, 17, and they're kind of run by the MLB organization. So um, they're 18 and under as well for the most part. And some guys from the U.S. fly in uh, and they basically get their work in. You know, they work on okay. uh, particular particular things that they might have to you sharpen their craft. So we got to, you know, play the Red Sox, uh, the Padres, the Brewers, all, all these um, like Dominican Summer League teams. And some of the studs are down there. And there was one yes. guy that stood out, actually, and he doesn't have a Bowman Chrome first. He, his name is Samuel Zavala, and he's on the Padres. Okay. And he was a dude that I, I thought, you know what, this guy, this guy might be a good guy. He's, he's super young, so he doesn't have a Bowman Chrome auto yet, but... He's, uh, I believe he's ranked fourth in the Padres organization and mm. he, no one really knows about him because obviously, you, you know, the chase of all the other guys like, um, you know, Robert Hassell, who was on the Padres, who got traded to the Nationals and then guys like CJ Abrams, their, their cards are always popular because, you know, that was the chase or the hype during release. So sure. I, I really like the Samuels of all the kid, whether he, whether or not, you know he's going to pan out that's kind of like the gamble you take but i i think he's he's already played uh you know a couple minor league seasons as an 18 year old now so um i really like i really like when i like seen him in person i was just like geez this guy's a beast this guy has a chance yeah. to really play so i'm, I'm high on him a couple of the u.s team usa guys obviously you get you get a lot of the young young stars so you know, next year you'll probably see, you know, seven first rounders out of there. So they'll probably be right. in the 2023, you know, Bowman draft, you know, case. And I just yeah, remember yeah, last nice. time. Yeah. Last time we went, uh, we were in, uh, Panama, um, qual- trying to qualify do, uh, for the world championship. Same thing. And that was when we talked about, you know, Corbin Carroll, um, Ro- mm. Robert Hassell, Bobby Witt Jr. 
Anthony Volpe, Jeez. all on one team. So it's like, how are you going to even compete with that? <laughs> right. right? So, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Sounds like you had a good time. And I hope this guy that you're talking about, Samuel, what's his Zav- last name? Zavala. Zavala? Yeah. I hope... I hope- yeah, I hope he blows up because then I'm going to play this episode. Episode 95 of Cards <laughs> to the Moon or Young Predicted. It's a sleeper move. I'm telling you, nobody like nobody heard of him because he doesn't have any cards out, right? So yeah. I'm hoping it sneaks under the radar. <laughs> nice. Uh, and they're all so young right now too, right? Super they're young. Teenagers. Yeah. Nice. And uh, I'm going to presume that the U.S. team won the gold in the tournament. They, they did. Um, usually... You know that's the case, and you know the the, for, the way the format is is the top four uh, in North America, South America qualify for the world world championship. So you had you had like Puerto Rico, Venezuela, you know Panama, Nicaragua, Mexico, U.S., us. Yeah. You know, so the the field is very deep. So it's it anything can happen in baseball. So uh, I I know uh, like Team Venezuela had eleven pro guys signed already. Wow. So they, yeah. So every game is just gonna be, you know, you're fighting like it's your, it's your last. So we played, sure. we put, play, we played well though overall, but you know, just yeah. I guess not well enough when we had to, and that kind of cost us. But the U.S. won gold, um, and they're basically the, the team to usually beat, for sure at yeah. that age group. Yeah, uh, I mean it's good for the sport too, right? Where. Um, the the level of competition is that high from all over the world so you know, Absol- that's what you like to see absolutely and I, like i said i played i played the game for a very long time and um you know i, I get to coach third when when i'm there with 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 the team and it's it's such a different game when you're when you're coaching mm-hmm. and the game is so fast um when you're not actually playing it and i think that's the biggest thing that i realize stepping outside and like actually seeing it from a, a coaching perspective is the speed of the game uh, how fast everything happens how fast people run how fast people throw when you're at the professional level you know that that's why the speed of the game is so quick because the athleticism of everybody is top notch mm-hmm. right so um sure. having having that perspective and when you're playing you don't realize these things because you just kind of play but then when you're when you're hands off you're you're kind of like monitoring right. so it's de- definitely interesting and like i said anytime you could you know put your country's name on your chest you know um the first time i put on a jersey was in 1999 as a as a junior national team member myself so right. it's been the fourth wow. fourth decade um for me to put on a jersey so the first time in the, tw- uh, in the 20 the year 2020s i guess so right. yeah looking forward to you know spending more time and i guess uh finding finding a little more about prospecting while i'm while i'm there <laughs> nice nice well good to have you back young so yeah uh with that let's move on now to hobby headlines so young because you were in mexico the past couple of weeks you unfortunately missed the sports card expo in toronto uh this month but I thought we could still do a segment on it, speaking more generally about live card shows these days. And we could talk about what seems to be the general sentiment in the hobby and maybe a few ideas on how we can improve the card show experience, especially during this this bear market. So before I begin, just a quick shout out to our hobby friend, Jared, who went to the show this past weekend, and he gave me a few of his thoughts as well on on uh, on the show as an attendee just like myself and um, Johnny as well he he went and will our guest host that filled in for you for the past couple of weeks he also went for a couple of days so um, so yeah first I want to say it was obvious and probably not surprising that the show wasn't as busy as it was than in previous years you know um, over the past two years particularly when the hobby was booming we talked about it before on this pod but it seems that you know the many it seems that many investor types have left the hobby, you know, not all of them, but mainly the quick flippers. And even though it was not as busy, I would also say that it was still um, not empty. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like it, it felt good that the hobby was still humming. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's not dead at all. All the, all the main, all the major pessimists might say the hobby's done. I would argue you know, just look at the number of attendance at the show that I went to, the day that I went to, right. uh, for sure. Like I had to like at times, you know, dodge a number of people <laughs> in these tight <laughs> um, aisles, right? So, right. so, uh, so yeah, it's it's all relative, I suppose. But 
for sure it was a good show uh, nevertheless second um, as I expected a lot of dealers are still pricing their cards way above comps <laughs> right I mean we talked about this before and uh, you know like I hear about this in the shows down south as well you yeah. know no one no one wants to sell at such a big loss right but it's probably why they still some of them still have a lot of inventory still hanging around right. too I, right yeah. so um, but the double negative thing about that is many dealers aren't looking to buy to add to their inventory because they already have a stack you know so so personally i found it tough to try to sell or even trade some of my cards i know uh will and john said the same thing and um yeah just just an observation and i know some people had success but they did have to probably give more value oh for for sure you know for their trades but if the dealers were willing to look at your cards they're probably offering as low as 60% comps oh, man. Um, and up to probably 80%, which is a little more fair. Uh, so right there, I think it made things a lot difficult to trade right. or find the right trading partner. You know, um, one dealer, I'm not joking about this, was fully transparent and said, listen, I don't trade fair. So, <laughs> you know, you had to be desperate to trade with a dealer like that. And, and you know what? There are some probably just wanting to unload. So, you know, Good for good for that dealer uh, to be straight up and honest. Um, one more thing before I ask, you know, if any of this surprises you, Hyung, but what was good to see, uh, in my opinion, is the corporate brand presence we talked about in previous podcast right. episodes, like eBay, all the grading companies, PSA, Beckett were there, uh, Tag, the new right, one, the right. new grading company. Slabs look uh, great. Had, yeah, yeah, they had a nice display. Uh, PWCC upper deck still having booths. You know, it's just good to see that. And even some of the bigger sports card content creators, Jared noted this out. You know, they came to the show like Jeff right. Wilson, a, sport, a sports card investor, king of the cards. He has a pretty um, big Instagram following and slap stocks as well. So it just goes to show that there are still some in the hobby that are still in it for the long haul, much, much like us here in this pod, right? So, yeah. I'm going to throw it to you. Initial thoughts about any of these observations? Well, I think I think we kind of like uh, speculated that that there's going to be more corporate, um, I guess, uh, companies that are going to take advantage of shows like this. Because if you think of sure. think of it from a business perspective, like we we go we go into it as dealers and traders and trying to get, just unload our cards. It's like a a free for all in terms of like slabs, but then. Yeah. You know, from a business perspective, any company could see, okay, who, who are my target audience? Are they all coming? So to me, I expected, I guess, uh, more presence on the, on the corporate side of things. And, and we both agreed that, you know, it wasn't a bad thing. You know, I know we Mm -hmm. always look at it. Oh, here's another company coming out, you know, and they're here to ruin the hobby. That's the first thing that people, people think of, right? But this is a good sign that you know there are more companies that are actually investing in you know um you know startups that could potentially change and better the markets right so having a strong presence of that just shows me that yeah long term i i believe the market is still bullish and i'm not surprised that you know dealers you know selling are trying to buy at like 60 percent comps or it's ridiculous i and i think it's going to work in waves of cycles because Mm -hmm. um If you think about it, the first cycle was, you know, um, people were buying at that, those prices, right? And the, the people that are trying to sell, they obviously don't want to go at a loss. So they're on the cycle of, you know what? I bought way too high and prices have, Mm, you know, obviously corrected itself and they're trying to get as much back for their loss. And I think the next cycle is going to be the same thing where, you know, um, I believe there's going to be a great buying opportunity of sports cards from now until the next year or so, 2024 mm-hmm. even. And then you're yeah. going to see the resurgence of, you know, um, uh, prices being reasonable and not, you know, because people are in profits. Right. So as those right. cycles occurs, I think uh, that's kind of in- inevitable. And we're just unfortunately on the on the downside of things. And we've we've discussed this in detail in our previous podcast is this is what we're kind of going into. So I think a lot of people don't want to sell it because they're just in it for too much. But the, that's the problem is is when when you have, you know, liquid cards that you know, have, have a high population count, you know, prices can't sustain themselves and people end up, 
literally right. uh, crashing the market because they're they're just trying to sell and cash out whatever they can, right? So I, I like I said, there's some people are still I think um, you know selectively buying right now. So I think mm-hmm. those are the great. I'm I'm pretty sure there were a couple people that did make those deals that they thought, you know what, this is yep. a card maybe I can't I can't get. Um, but yeah, like uh, it's. I guess it's 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 a little bad news that I, I wasn't able to make it because of the trip. So I was looking forward to it, but um, based on kind of like uh, the feedback, it, it it's not saying that I didn't miss too much, but you know, I guess there wasn't as <laughs> right. much action, you know, as uh, people anticipated or, or wanted. But I think that's kind of yeah. normal, and I think as we see that uh, there's going to be some shows, and depending on timing of the market where it's going to mm-hmm. it's going to pick up again and you know people are in profits and they're trying to you know just you know sell uh and and happy be happy with their profits yeah no that makes total sense to me the the idea of cycles and where we are in the cycle right and um you know what you just said too like in terms of some dealers buying bigger cards like cards that they might not see right um in a while i think Jared also mentioned that, like, unless you have a nice big card, dealers aren't looking really. Like, right. you know, gone are the days of buying junk slabs or trying to unload your Keston Huras. Or, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Or, uh, you know, you, you can't you can't uh, sell multiples of those and try to get a bigger card. Like, right. it's just no dealers looking at those. But, you know, I guess with that said, Young, I think out of the three of us on this podcast, you would probably would have had the best luck because you have some monster cards that you could have easily showcased around right. and, certain and, dealers. And, and that's the thing is like what what I realized too, like um, you know, that was part of the like my my strategy. You know, it was it was mm. time to like in 2022. One of my goals was to liquidate. You know, the stuff that I don't want or I don't even love collecting. You know, or I don't, um, I just have it because I pulled it and I got it graded and, you know, I'm in profits. So it's, it's, uh, the whole goal, uh, by, by the end of 2022 was to really thin out my inventory and be super selective in terms of what Mm -hmm. I'm buying. And I think for now, now is the time that I'm really being picky with my purchases and going more long term strategy and kind of like more, um, uh, not as risky. So, uh, so these cards, like, even though I guess I, w- I would have liked to deal some of them, I, th- I think unless, you know, it was an offer that I couldn't re- refuse, the cycle would be, I'm just trying to add to my portfolio and try to grow it. I'm not necessarily looking to flip, yeah. flip my portfolio, uh, even though I could cash out, um, I'm just gonna have to reinvest that money in, right? So yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. a big believer in, you know, again what we talk about collecting what you love and Mm -hmm. obviously part of that has uh, value associated with it too but for me it's the rarity um because i've i've had the the pains where i've sold way too early on cards that i shouldn't have because i can't get those cards (laughs) back nor will i ever see it again and you know um i guess for me it's it's more of the long-term game and kind of like uh, being selective and like these shows are perfect because I'm doing the same thing. I'm not going to buy any junk slab. If I'm going to buy a junk slab, um, you know, yeah, 60% comps do make sense, right? Because I'm just going to try to flip in it anyways, or sure. I, I might have a buyer that, you know, likes that certain player. But other than that, I'm, I'm going in more of the kind of like a strategic purchases where I think it's a solid investment in, in the long run. So yeah, and yeah. that includes more of the scarce, the scarcity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that's a pretty solid strategy for sure, especially during this time. I guess one question I do have right now is then you know while we're in this bear market where no one seems to be buying uh, other than bigger cards, is there anything we can do to improve the local card show experience like over the next year? Because I would expect you know even in twenty twenty three. We might be on the down part of the cycle still, right? Right, because yeah, and I, I think I think it's just gonna uh, take time uh, because, like I said, people people for the most part are in it for the right reasons. So as mm-hmm. as uh, time goes by, and you know, people are accepting some of their losses, like some of the stuff you got to remember. If you look at any 
any you know um, graph over the last two years it's it follows the exact same pattern like there was and crypto mm-hmm. goes the same way stocks go the same way like you got to understand real estate goes the same way so I think there's a mixture of like the corporate world too coming in you know all these companies uh, that are investing millions of dollars into new companies and kind of like you make that a better experience um, because obviously these these companies have bigger marketing budgets than individual dealers. I think it's going to change the way card shows are going to be because I think there's going to be more value and you know getting more free swag stuff. You know because now uh, companies are competing for you know the marketing space or to make a big splash at shows because it's not necessarily about you know selling cards or getting rid of cards. But then I think as time goes by, people won't waste time with junk slabs because really nobody's right. buying junk slabs right so all you see is right now people are trying to get rid of their junk right um and it shows right but then if you have guys that uh dealer after dealer that you know has you know pretty amazing cards even if you're not a buyer i think that itself is an experience to see to walk around and see like museum pieces you know yeah. Sure. And th- and to me, that's that's what a card show is all about. It's not necessarily oh, I've I killed it by making X amount of dollars. It's like right. okay, there's this new company that I've seen that gets me excited. There's this uh, new company I've seen or a new app I've seen. I think I could use it, you know. Or yeah. you know, there's this card I've seen. Oh my god, I'll save save up for a year to to buy this card. I've seen it in a person. That's what I want. I talked to that guy Mm -hmm. and maybe in a year I'm able to afford it. I'm going to put in an offer, right? So it's the whole experience that I I guess I would like to, you know, get back to the true true roots of, you know, how when we were kids, if if we went to a card show, we're like, I can't wait. I can't wait till just walk around, you know, and see what's out there and just, just be a kid again, right? So. Yeah, no, excellent points for sure. I had similar... Uh, ideas like you know i think especially for 2023 if the economy is going to be in a recession or stay in a recession yeah we got to kind of almost change expectations going into these card shows it's not just about flipping uh quickly because it's it's not easy to do anymore but yeah it's like you said it's just getting to know others in the hobby and you know you could commiserate together during this bear market but uh also yeah likes to see what other um companies are out there i love the I love what you said about looking at grail cards and, you know, like it also, uh, you know, on, from a personal standpoint as a collector, um, one strategy I might employ is that, you know, I would try to sell all like you already did, Hyung, like in the last year, try to liquidate as much as possible the cards that you're not really in love with. You just kind of got it right. by ripping packs. You graded it, think you could make a quick profit. And maybe now you can't make as much of a profit, right. but you might as well have cash on hand for those cards. For sure. Maybe you have to sell at 50, 60% comps, even on eBay or online, for sure. and then accumulate that cash. And then when you go to these card shows, you might see that one card that you love, that you like a lot more. And you're buying, it, you just you're buy. buying, you're buying it for cheap anyways, right? Or at, at, at a exactly. lower price. So, you know, cash yeah. out and put it into a bigger card and it won't exactly. hurt as yeah. much, right? Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, just uh, and you know, like uh, I also, I've also been thinking, like you know, I've seen more, especially here in Canada now. We have uh, um, more card stores. LCS is opening, and that's uh, been a good sign that the ho- hobby is still still uh, robust. Uh, but they all, they all, but all of them are holding trade nights, and I feel like that's going to be a bigger factor in right. the in the next year when you're not buying or selling but maybe you could find that right trading partner with people in the community right and that might be something um, to look into um so yeah that's another idea i know i don't know too much about this so i won't spend too much time talking about it but i know whatnot the company whatnot right. um they just had some kind of virtual card show with multiple dealers and i don't know if there was like time slots where some bigger dealers got to try to sell their stuff so it's kind of a virtual booth um, that might be another interesting idea, especially for people that can't make it to these live card shows. But taking on the digital realm right. is kind of, um, you know, um, almost to be expected going yeah. into next year as well. I, so I think that'll be more. I will. Common. I will say this too. I think a lot of people, and we're going to see the backlash of this uh, over the past couple of years. I guess a lot of people, you know, joined the hobby and 
um, maybe not necessarily know the rules of in terms mm. of kind of like how taxes work. So I think right. a, a lot of people that sold don't realize, you know, what capital gains are and they, they kind of scratch their head to saying, okay, how much taxes do I owe? And I think what you're going to see is a lot of people get hit with, you know, unexpected, you know, capital gains uh, that they right. owe taxes to. So a, a way around that would be obviously trading, right? So you could always constantly trade up mm -hmm. and not there because there's no, you know, monetary tran transaction, right? It, it, it could start becoming more popular to barter instead of kind of like uh, ha actually having um, a transaction of, of a sale in yeah, product, true. right? So that might also change this spectrum of card shows moving forward as well. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's not just something to think about. Uh, I think a lot of people have questions regarding, you know, stuff like that. And they end up potentially leaving the hobby because it's, it's like they do all this work for a small amount mm -hmm. of profit and you realize, well, I just, you know, owe more in taxes at the end of the year. Right. So, and right. obviously we, the, the right thing to say is speak to your accountant. You know, there's different mm -hmm. rules to different, uh, business style. So, um, Absolutely. you know, act accordingly, I would say, because the rules are definitely different. For sure. For sure. Um, that just gave me an idea. Trade nights, you know, they always usually happen after the main show. I feel like there should be an area in the card show where it happens during the card right. show. You know, like you can go, you know, just an idea for the sports card expo organizers. So this is a big trade, a trade room or something, you know, exactly. That, it's like the smokers yeah. room. You know, in, in, <laughs> right. in the airport where, you know, people just go and smoke in the airport. It's like this would be the new venue or the room to just, you know, trade. I like it. That's, yeah, that's a great analogy. <laughs> so I hope people are listening, people that are organizing future card shows. I think I think that's a way to go. All right. Um, yeah, hopefully uh, if, if, you know, we always like to throw it back to our listeners. If you guys have any good ideas or uh, cool ideas that you want to share with us um, about how to improve live card shows, especially over the next year. Yeah, let us know. You could always reach us at Instagram at Cards to the Moon, and uh, we'll uh, bring it up in our next podcast episode. Okay, let's move on to our next segment. We're simply calling Buy, Sell, Hold. So we haven't done this in a while, but I'm going to list some players who are either super hot right now or really cold and trending downward. And then you tell me if you would buy, sell, or hold their cards at this time. Okay, so let's start with the players who are selling remarkably well according to the Card Ladder Player Index, which I looked up. And uh, yeah, we could see the trend in value based on recent sales of some of the player's key cards. So it kind of takes an aggregate mm -hmm. and then and it projects a trend. So the numbers I'm quoting are estimates over the past month, okay, in terms of increase in value or decrease in value. So I'm going to start off with a couple of football quarterbacks, and this will be no surprise why they're trending upwards. Jalen Hurts over the last month has seen a 65% growth in value. Might be because the Eagles are 8-1 and one this season. Yeah, they lost their first, um, first game. Against the Commanders. Yeah. That's Football's funny that way. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and that's why that's why I'm gonna say a sell. <laughs> because there's so so much more uh I guess risk that can happen. Like mm. you know, I, I was you know I was a sell on Hertz before too, but as as obviously they the Eagles were were undefeated, you know, his prices kept kept on creeping up because there was a yeah. point in time where Jalen Hurts was cheap. Mm -hmm. So now it's like we're, 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 if you see those graphs where, you know, you see the two year graph where it's the spike and then the, the tumble and then the correction and then it's a slow kind of like healthier, I guess, trend. I think we're at that spike where you're right. going to see a tumble in Jalen Hurts' price. So, I think, I think you either want to catch it on, on, on the way up of that, that peak or on the way down. I think if, if, if you're going to be holding it, you're going to go for a long ride and go all the way back down. So I'm going to say Jalen Hurts is a sell. Okay. Yeah. It makes total sense to me. I'm saying it's a sell. 
But I also said that at the beginning of the season, and <laughs> Jalen Hurts completely burned me. So, <laughs> so uh, I apologize in advance if he continues to go up with my um, prediction to sell once again. <laughs> All right, next quarterback, Justin Fields. This is more interesting. He's seen about a 45% growth. The Bears that he plays for are 3-7 and seven now, so on a losing team. But he's been doing ridiculous things, you know, on the field, rushing, you know, everything that, you know, you want to see in Justin Fields, the potential right. that he had going into the season. You're kind of seeing the last two games. So what are you doing with Fields? Uh, with Fields, I'm, I'm saying it's a sell as well. Like, I... I think the reason why there is so much growth is because Justin Fields' price was so cheap at one point, mm. right? So what you're seeing is a correction in either way. So, but the problem is, I think from from the mid to long term, like some people might, you know, believe in Justin Fields in the long term, but in my opinion, it's going to come down until he establishes himself as an actual, you know, a star quarterback. And, you know, takes his team deep into a, a playoff role. And, you know, you look at the trends of all quarterbacks that, you know, look at look at Justin Herbert, for instance. You know, like the, the expectations of Justin Herbert. Herbert was, like, ridiculous. Same with Joe Burrow. It's like those aren't sustainable. We, we think that, like, Pat Mahomes is going to do what he did, you know, in the last uh, or, like, three or four years. Every year, it doesn't make any sense. So, for me, right. Justin Fields was so cheap. So, I think that spike in growth was kind of like people who've seen that potential in Justin Fields, they, they made the profit, but now yeah. you're kind of playing with that. Okay. How high is it going to go before it comes sure. to back down a bit? So I'm also a, a sell on Justin Fields because, uh, he's a, he's, you said 45% growth. I think that's pretty good, but I think that it's not necessarily overpriced. You know what I mean? I think okay. it's just, it yep. was so cheap that that's what you're seeing as the growth. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say hold, but because I, I, I just like Justin Fields as a quarterback, like his talent's still there. And I think what you just said is key to why I'm saying it's a hold because it's not overpriced yet. Right. I think it's corrected itself because I do agree with you. It's so low. And in the past month, you're seeing that spike because of what he's do, been doing on the field. But at, so, at some point, he's got to win games for the Bears. That team's got to do right. much better than they are now. But if you believe in the talent, he's priced about right, in, uh, you know, in my opinion. Um, and, and then, you know, like uh, if he could build on his current success, then I could see it go a bit higher. Right. But this is more of a longer-term hold. Right. And you and, take the risks associated with and, that. And too, you right? kind of see the cycles. For, for instance, Jalen Hurts was probably in the same situation as Justin Fields a year ago. Where it sure. was a mediocre Philadelphia team, and then they make off-season moves, and you know Jalen Hurts' price started spiking at the beginning of the season. So I think timing it would would be key too, because you're in the midseason, but then in the off-season, I think uh, depending um, depending there there might be great opportunity to kind of like play that game for for the next for next season, right? So yeah, totally agree. Okay, one more from the trending upward category. Tyrese Maxey of the Philadelphia 76ers. 22.8 yeah. points on average, I believe. I'm just looking up the stats right now for this year. Just building on a crazy good season last season right. as well. So I, I like Maxey, so, yeah. So yeah, what do you think? I, I think he was really cheap to begin with. So I think that's what you're seeing with, with the growth is the consistency in play and um, it's kind of similar to the Justin Fields, but I mean, Tyus right. Maxey, I would say he's backing it up, uh, with individual performance. Um, and you know, but that's what worries me is like, we've, we've talked about these young rookies, like the Trey Youngs, the, you know, Donovan Mitchells and stuff like that, who are the young stars that get no love in the hobby because they're in the fourth, fifth year now and yeah. it, it ends up tanking right so it depends on where you are with maxi because this is his third season um mm -hmm. so you're you're looking at that same kind of trend that you're going to see with the jason tatums with the uh, donovan mitchells and and so i think there are buying opportunities still because i think tyrus maxi was was cheap to begin with so i think it's part of that growth that we're seeing is because of that yeah so, yeah so I'd say yeah, I'm, I'm, like I'm, I'm a hold for Tyrese Maxey because I do believe in his oh. talent. 
Yep. I, I would say I'm a little more bullish on Maxi, so I'm going to say there. I think there he's a buy uh, for certain cards. Uh, the 76ers, I feel like they're just beginning to hit their stride. They kind of stumbled out of the gate. They were expected to do well. Some predicted them to win the Eastern Conference, and and now they're like, oh, you know, the East like is so strong this season. Right. So who knows where the 76ers will be? But you know, they certainly have a great team, and if Harden comes back. Harden's injured, right? I, I don't remember. But um, yeah, if they have their full team, Maxi's obviously a key player on that team. I think he'll just continue to grow in confidence. And uh, well, Joel and Bede had a couple of ridiculous games. So, you know, the Sixers as a team gets better. Um, yeah, I just I just think Maxi's going to be a key part. And I think there are cheaper cards to get even now. And um, I don't know. I like basketball right now. It's dipped so hard. You know, over the last uh, half year, yeah, you know, right. compared to the other sports, I just think in general there's more buying opportunities now for basketball for sure. than than in the other sports. So I like Maxi as a play. All right, we'll go to the other side where these cards are trending downwards for whatever reason. Um, I think each case is a little bit different, but the first guy in baseball, Spencer Torkelson. Mm. He's dropped about 69% in value over the past month. Man, um, Spencer Torkelson is a little tough for me. You know, he he, had, he was so hyped up uh, to begin with. And part of yeah. that was, you know, him being, um, you know, a pretty high draft pick with the expectation of the world on him, right? I mean, he was mm-hmm. a guy that played for Arizona State University and just absolutely mashed. And I think that's one of the things that um, was expected out of him to to be a hitter to be a a plus bat and for me the hype initially had his prices so high that you know it's inevitable for it to crash with you know he hit 203 last year in his first full season and you know in general um you know he's he hasn't really had much success uh and that kind of concerns me going into kind of like uh his 22 23 he's 23 now i believe 23 24 so mm-hmm. um I, and then i look back at guys like pete alonzo you know who are his comps and how are uh, his comps cards doing so guys like pete alonzo that hit 52 his first rookie season and torkelson hitting 203 with eight right and for me right. it's like alonzo gets no love Jordan Alvarez gets no love. Guys that have done it. And it's like, what does Spencer Torkelson have to do for his prices to, to kind of like sustain itself? And I, I think he could hit next year 270 with 35 home runs and 100 RBIs. And where his prices were at before, I still don't think they have, you know, a chance. And part of that is that he's, he's a young rookie. He's part of the hype in the, in, in the releases uh, of this year. But those are things that I think eventually will correct itself. So I'm a I'm a sell on Spencer Torkelson. I think, um, uh, yeah, I, I just feel like there's so much better options out there for what people are paying for for Spencer. Yeah. So I hope he I like like I I like him as a player. I think he's gonna potentially be a good baseball player. But like I said, in terms of card card value, like I'd rather buy Pete Alonso at this point. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I I hear what you're saying. Um, I think I'm gonna. I think I was just checking the prices for Spencer Torkelson's Bowman Chrome, his first auto yeah. PSA ten. It once sold for twenty two hundred. Yeah. You know, in in when he was coming up, and and the last one sold for. Can you guess? I'm gonna say uh, Spencer Torkelson. I'm gonna say seven hundred. Three thirty. Wow. So that's uh, so. <laughs> And <laughs> so it's, it's it's tumbled. It's tumbled. That's the so wow. tempting. I think I think I'm holding if I have it because right. you know like you just gotta wait till next season. Hope that you know the Tigers are a bit better and then he finds his groove a little bit more and then starts mashing like he's capable right. of. Um, but in the off season, if it drops even more, which I anticipate it might, like to say gets a 200 PSA 10 right. Bowman Chrome, I might. I might buy at that point, yeah, you know, yeah. and just and because like, I, I like what you're saying, like the, compared to other players. Yeah. What does he have to do? But he's still going into his second year. So yeah. the shine is just a little bit there. Whereas Alonzo, you're either in or you're out and, and he's kind of boring. And, and Torkelson is going to have yeah. to perform like this year. It's kind of going to be like, okay, he's going to go 25 now and he hasn't established that career. But yeah, I mean, if there's a lot to like, like he's definitely, you know, a, a guy that, 
has upside to him in terms of his stick and what he can do with it. So yeah. it's yeah, it's just a matter of uh, when when you're gonna you know sell and buy buy and sell, I guess. All right, all right, okay. Um, next one. This is curious to me. Wayne Gretzky yeah. saw a thirty eight percent drop over the last month. Yeah. I don't know if he's just. Uh, you know, people aren't thinking about Gretzky now. It, make, but yeah, it makes what, sense to me. I think what's happening is you're going to see the majority of the volatility spike uh, on Gretzky's, uh, like the PSA eight and up. You know, the price, the, the 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 good, the expensive grades, basically, because I think at the height of those, those had the most to come down because um, right, okay. they're psa 10s psa 9s they're still higher pop counts so i don't think it was enough to sustain itself uh at those prices so i think those are you're showing the the, the data might show that those are dropping but i think where there was extreme value in the past was the lower grade psas and i think i think they're on a more healthier trend um in terms of they have less correction or they might have proper correction in the right direction, right? Where uh, maybe a PSA three or a PSA four was was really cheap, right? And now it's more on a you know slow, steady gain where it's growing, you know, three four percent, um, you know, per year or whatever it is, or maybe it's a little more than that. But I would I would think that the majority of the card and why it's showing a downward trend is because the PSA nines, for instance, they sold. For tons of money, I think 100, 111k for a PSA nine at one point. I, I could be right. totally wrong on that value, but there's a lot. If it dips to like sixty thousand or fifty thousand, that's a huge drop, you know, as opposed to a PSA six that really hasn't gone up during that spike. It's kind of like maintained its kind of healthy trend, right? So, um, I I think personally uh, think Wayne Gretzky is always a buy. Um, mm-hmm. and so I would be looking at, you know, those, those volatility markers and maybe potentially where you think the bottom is on any particular grade you're targeting. And I think it's a great buying opportunity for Wayne, Wayne Gretzky. What you kind of explain makes sense to me. And, and I guess the only difference between you and I is you'll be trying to get the PSA nine while I'll be trying to get the PSA four. <laughs> I have a okay, PSA so. four for sale if you need. <laughs> okay. We'll talk after the show. <laughs> All right, the last one is Cade Cunningham of the Detroit Pistons. Almost saw a, almost thirty five percent drop over the past month. Yeah, I'm I'm a sell with Cade Cunningham too. Um, like I said, you look at you you know even Lamelo, um, you know guys that you know have success in in their first year, and it's not like they're killing it. You know, I go back to Trey Young. It's like, what does Trey Young have to do now that his Atlanta Hawks are winning too? Right. It's like, what else does he have to do? And he's entering his fifth year and he's, he's scoring more points than anybody in the last, you know, five years. Put him with anybody and he's up there. So I see it the same way. It's like all these young stars, you know what? There's a lot to be excited for, you know, but there's also a lot of good stars that are currently playing that I think have way more value and, uh, you know, halt that Hall of Fame trajectory. So I think um, Cade Cunningham, he, I think he's injured again, or he's injured right now. So I think that's taking effect on you know his card values. Um, right. And I don't think the Pistons are doing too hot either, right? So uh, yeah, mm-hmm. just a, I think double whammy for Cade. And I know you, you're thinking, hey, maybe there's a good buying opportunity. <laughs> I'm just staying off y- younger stars in general for now, unless it's Fair. it's it's a Tyrese Maxey situation where it's like a young star that didn't get no love and there's great buying opportunity, but all Cade Cunningham, Jalen Green, Scotty Barnes, all these guys were the hype, you know? So yeah, it's like, sure. you got, you got to always remember that Zion Williamson, John Morant in 2019. Right. Uh, you know, and the list goes on. Right. So mm-hmm. it depends on where, um, prices were before. And I think Cade was over overpriced just because of the hype. So I'm a sell. Yeah. Oh man, so tempting. <laughs> you read my mind. I, I, like I said before, I'm just kind of generally bullish on basketball cards because of how much they dipped, and I feel like when the market rebounds, the the basketball card market will rebound um, pretty well, in my opinion. So, but but I to your point, it's not 
super cheap for Cunningham cards still. Right. So so you're right. Like where Maxi is, uh, I feel like much more of a deal. Um, yeah, Cunningham, I would just probably wait and and hold at this point. And he's injured. He's only, I guess, projected to miss four games. So we'll see after that. And the Pistons probably won't be a contender this season as well. But you know, as the season progresses, if there's um, you know, if people start to forget about the Pistons and, you know, Cunningham, I think he's a special talent. So, the, so that's why I'm still interested. So there's a price where I would pull the trigger. But right now, I, I think it's still he's still a hold. Okay, that's another segment of buy, sell, hold based on current trends. And, you know, we might revisit this segment maybe in a month to see who the new players are that are right. spiking upwards and spiking downwards. Right. So we'll see. Let's move on to our regular weekly segment we call Pick One. And if you're a new listener to our podcast, this is when uh, the two of us in this uh, show will we'll put up two players or two cards, and then we debate which one we would rather invest in. So, Hyung, as usual, do you want to start things sure. off? Sure. Um, I'm going to go baseball again because mm-hmm. I'm just trying to put like real-life situations together because... I feel like, you know, sometimes like people, how do people really buy cards? Sometimes it's on a budget. Usually it's within a budget. I want to invest in A player or B player. Um, and I want this card for them at this price, right? So I tried sticking at the thousand dollar budget. So I have two cards that, uh, I put up against in the thousand dollar budget. One, I went over budget. One, I went under budget. (laughs) And I, I think it's realistically, um, a good kind of like uh, comparison of what you would invest in because I'm I'm genuinely curious as well. I'm I would I would be legitimately debating these two just based on mm-hmm. the prices. So the first card is uh, Vladimir Guerrero Jr.'s Bowman Chrome in 2016. His Refractor Auto. So out of 4.99, a BGS 95 True Gem um, sold for $1,235 last week. Okay. And at the peak, that was a, about a $3,000 card. So it's a retraction of about 56% in the last three months. So obviously a, a good buy at 1200 in my opinion. So I, I went slightly over budget with that card. And I'm pairing it up with a Jordan Alvarez Bowman Chrome in 2018. His Bowman First Chrome Refractor Auto PSA 10 sold for $750. So that also um, hit peak uh, within the last three months. And obviously Jordan was, was, was a superstar, you know, the whole year and in the playoffs and World Series. That price was just as high as 1600 and Jordan's prices were cheap in general. So 750 bucks is probably kind of like in general, it's still high because people made profit off that because people are buying that at 300 bucks, 200 bucks when nobody wanted Jordan, right? So it's, it does show it's on a downward trend. Um, and 750 seems to be kind of like a dipped price. Uh, but if you had a thousand bucks, would you spend the extra 250 bucks to buy that Vladdy? Or would you go with the PSA 10 Jordan Alvarez at 750? Man, this is a really tough one. Oh, Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh. I'm going to try to not let my Blue Jays bias get in the way of this <laughs> pick one. Um, man, so cheap, the Alvarez. And it's Pop 66 on the Alvarez versus, uh, uh, I believe it's Pop 217 for the BGS 9.5. For Vladimir For Guerrero. Vlad's wow. Refractor Auto. Uh, okay, I'm... My brain is telling me to go with Jordan Alvarez, <laughs> <laughs> but, but my heart, I, 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 I always got to go with my heart and my God is, is, is Vladdy. And I think, I don't know, because I, the hobby seems to hate the Astros right. and Alvarez and, you know, like he's played phenomenally. You know, in the in the recent playoffs where they won the World Series, FYI, for people following baseball, right. <laughs> you know, he was a key contributor to oh, that, man. you know, to the pennant, right? And and yet, it's still just fluctuating. Like right. you know, I'm looking at the car ladder chart for that card, and it's like up, down, up, down, up, down. 
where you would expect you know a player of his caliber and the way he's contributing in the postseason would see an upward trend. So I don't know if that would change anytime soon. I don't know if the hobby's ready for someone like Jordan Alvarez, you know. Yeah. Um, but whereas I feel like Vladdy might be a more likable guy if the Jays can do can have another great season, make a make a um, a postseason push that went further than where we went with the against the Mariners, and you know I just think they're a fun team, and maybe. That's probably my bias, but you know, I think I think Vladdy can um, can get up there. I'm more confident that he can get back up there in terms of um, closer to his peak value right. than than Jordan Alvarez, who has accomplished everything in terms of you know winning the World Series. And you know, like if Vladdy won the World Series, I would imagine there will be a spike right. and not this volatility or fluctuation that we're seeing with Jordan cards for for whatever reason. <laughs> so I'm going with. Vladimir, with the uh, upside. Nice. Point. We should we should uh, we should do a post on this because I'm I'm genuinely <laughs> like I want I want to see yeah, the consensus. Let's hold a poll. Yeah, let's do uh, a poll and because I'm going Jordan. You're still with I'm Jordan, still with eh? Jordan. I I just <laughs> I just I just think he is he is probably one of the greatest modern day hitters around, and it, it's like he always proves me wrong. I always sell him, mm-hmm. sell him short, and I'm like, nobody wants Jordan. And then I'm like, crap, I shouldn't have got rid of that Orange Wave PSA 10. And then it's like, the <laughs> autos are so cheap. His tops Chrome, tops Chrome Sapphire, like, and it's like nobody wants him. And then I'm like, I watch him play. I'm like, this guy is a dude. Like, this guy is the real deal. Like, there's, Beast. yeah, there's, there's very few players that I'm putting him in the same category. And obviously, Vladdy still falls into that category. And, you know, you can't go wrong with that, like, 2016 Bowman Chrome of Vladdy's. Like, it's it's one of the cards that kind of, like, everybody was after on release. It was such a hyped yeah. card that it will, I think, eventually become iconic, um, whereas Jordan's card won't be. But I think, I think in the short run, I think Jordan puts up another season of 300-plus with, like, 35, 40 home run potential. And he was probably runner up, or I don't know where he, he was in the MVP race, but he had to be up there. And I just think 750 is really cheap. And um, comparing it to Vladdy's, you know, BGS 95, I think there's value in that, but that means that 95 BGS is selling for half of his PSA 10. So it True. would put Vladdy's PSA 10 refractor at about 2,500 to 3,000 right now. So I just look at that and say, you know what? I could see Jordan's prices doing that, um, you know, one of these days. When whenever he gets the love he deserves, I know that it's more expensive than a seven hundred fifty dollar card, because he's slowly he's slowly winning a lot of awards, right? If you look at uh, Jordan Jordan's lines and you know the brass, like you know Soto did it before he won you know a batting title and then he won a World Series. Uh, Jordan's not too far off. He's, I mean, he's he had a six point eight WAR this this season, and he's still young. Yeah, and he, he he puts together, you know, a few more of those years. You know, I think he'll be up in the fifty WAR by the time he's like, you know, thirty in his low thirties. And to me, it's like that's now getting you into serious Hall of Fame consideration, right? So, sure. um, yeah, I like I like Jordan's prices at seven fifty. Um, I'm still a buyer of, of, of Vlad. I just think I'm hesitant of spending that extra $500 when I could pick up something like a Jordan. Yeah. So I'm going to go with the Jordan, but I'm interested to see because I think you're going to get... We'll do a poll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That would be, that'd be okay. awesome. Yeah, nice. I hope you're right because I feel like he might be... Well, let me get into my pick one and then I'll make the comparison. Okay. Trey Young, uh, Silver Prism, PSA 10. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to bring him back one more time. Um, I hope I hope Jordan's not, your Jordan is not my Trey Young, <laughs> where you're just waiting and waiting for the hobby to give the player the proper respect. Right. But anyway, I'm going to put Trey Young, Silver Prism, PSA 10 rookie card, which is about, what, 350, 360 now? And... Um, I still have. I'm still holding. I'm still believing 
that this season people will begin to give him a little bit more respect, you know, as the Atlanta Hawks are winning games. And um, I'm going to pit that against another player who's been playing really well, Donovan Mitchell. And we talked about him in a past podcast episode too. And we're like, you know, I feel like the last time I saw him off him because there's no respect. But is his price too cheap now? I think it's going for a similar amount, 360 370 wow. So comparable prices for his Silver Prism PSA 10. Yeah. And um, yeah, why don't put those two guys up there? Okay. I'm, and th- this is crazy because I'm, I'm a Trey Young believer. Um, mm-hmm. But for me, the way Donovan Mitchell's playing this year, and also insane. it's insane. And this is what we are saying with best case Donovan Mitchell. And you have the perfect marriage here in terms of pop count on the silver. Um, right. You know what I mean? And that's huge. Love, so right? uh, the pop count on the, the the silver prism of the Donovan Mitchell of the PSA 10 is 575. Pop count on the uh, silver of Trey is 2,150. So you're talking about four times more the production of, of mm-hmm. Trey Young's card over Donovan Mitchell. And uh, you're talking about you know for, uh, the same price. And if you look at the three-month trend, obviously you see the Eiffel Tower on both. Um, you know, Trey Young's obviously a bit earlier because, you know, he had that huge spike, um, in, in probably a couple years ago. And then you see the downtrend and very similar looking graphs, to be honest. Um, but I think both are kind of like at its, at its dip, at its, uh, low. But I think the, the pop 575 on the Mitchell is going to help sustain it a little better. And the way he's playing this year, I could see it kind of like have that potential of like kind of like exploding if he keeps up the way he's playing if utah keeps on you know winning i think uh his prices may go up because i don't know what trey young has to do i've been it i've been through his (laughs) cards like every like in his highs and lows and his cards ain't ain't doing any anything because i'm if you look at the trend i'm on trey young see where the middle finger is (laughs) <laughs> I'm on the bottom of that trend, and you could see that's a long downtrend of just yeah. miserable, right? So it's like Trey Young's having his <laughs> typical year. Um, the only difference yeah. is Atlanta's, you know, a little more, you know, older and and better. So mm-hmm. it's interesting to see, but I don't think Trey Young's prices are gonna uh, go as crazy as we're expecting. But I could see Donovan Mitchell's prices go there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I won't uh, make this too long. I'm going to agree with you. It's going to be a Donovan Mitchell sweep, as much as that hurts me to say, because, man, I think at the beginning of the season, I, I said, I'm going to give Trey Young one more year, you know, for his cards to do something. Because, right. you know, DeJounte Murray's on the team. Right. I think Atlanta Hawks are a much better team. And they're, you know, in the early in the season, they're showing that they are a better team. But, um, but you know, to all your points that you mentioned about, Donovan Mitchell, and I'm going to add like the Cleveland Cavaliers just look like a, a, a really good team. They play well together. You got Mobley, you got Jarrett, and you know, you got like um, Darius Garland. Like they might make it, you know, a real run at the Eastern Conference Championships, right. you know, and, and who knew? Mitchell just had to get out of yeah. Utah to actually start <laughs> to play unselfishly and to step up. Uh, as well you know just get away from rudy gobert who's uh the timberwolves are are another story so we'll talk about that later but um yeah mitchell um if you know just for the pop cut pop count alone as you mentioned like i could see that go up when people realize like wow actually this is under 600 pop count for a silver prison psa 10 i I don't know if a lot of people are aware of that fact even so i think i think that's going to be a key factor in you know what if he continues to play well we could we could see that spike in the silver prison psa 10 so yeah i might i might have to sell my trey young at a loss and then just pick up a donovan mitchell while they're the same price (laughs) that might be the smart yeah you might you might be able to get some of that money back uh quicker at least right it'd be a parallel move kind of and then it's like yeah which one will you know spike up first Yep, knowing my luck, Trey Young's gonna shoot up once I sell yeah. my last <laughs> Trey Young card. <laughs> but hey, what can you do? All right, uh, that's another episode for Cards to the Moon. Thanks again to all our listeners and subscribers for joining us. 
And uh, if you um, haven't done so already and you enjoyed this episode, we really appreciate you if you gave us uh, five stars on wherever you listen to your podcast. All right, till next week, we'll see you soon. Bye. Hey, thanks for listening to Cards to the Moon. We'd really appreciate you subscribing to our podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. And you can also connect with each of us on Instagram at Five Card Guys, or you can follow Hyung at Integrity Sports Cards or John at Trade You at Recess. You can also check us out at fivecardguys.com. Thanks again and hope to connect soon.